Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about generational issues related to recovery from childhood to grandparenthood. Joining us in our panel today are Dr. Stephen J. Wolin, Clinical Professor of Psychiatry at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences, Washington, D.C. Dr. Tian Dayton, Director of the New York Psychodrama Training Institute, author and Huffington Post blogger, New York, New York. Cynthia moreno Tui, Executive Director at the Association for Addiction Professionals and author, Alexandria, Virginia. Dr. Tony Decker, Primary Care and Telemedicine Physician at the Northern Arizona Veterans Administration Healthcare System, Flagstaff, Arizona. So Cynthia, why is it important to talk about generational issues uh, when, we, when we're talking about the issues of mental and substance use disorders within families? It's very important to talk about this because families have been reticent about talking about their family history. Sometimes they don't know it. They know that there's something there. They're not exactly sure what it is. There's family secrets. There's embarrassment. There's not sure what was wrong or what was happening in the family. So when families start talking about what they know, they'll say, oh, maybe grandfather was drinking so much and that's why he died on the railroad tracks. Maybe it was that uh, there was family history with an uncle that was having difficulty with his job or keeping a job, but nobody really knew what was happening. They knew something wasn't quite right. So the more that we start talking about what we know about our family, history, about who had mental illness, who had addiction, alcohol or drug problems, the more that we can then start sorting it and understand how that has affected us and what we need to be aware of for ourselves so that we're not recreating those generational patterns. And how uh, large and how broad is this problem? How many children are affected in the United States? It's about 12.9% uh, which means about 8.3 million children in the United States. And Stephen, uh, Cynthia touched on some of the characteristics of these families. Um, I, I know you're, you're very uh, in tune with, with family uh, psychiatry and, and you've treated many, many families and written extensively. Can you describe for us, please, what are some of the characteristics of families experiencing generational behavioral health issues? Yes, I can. I want to start, though, by congratulating SAMHSA on taking this issue of the generational question, because it's probably the first time that I can remember that in a discussion like this, we're starting with families. Think family has been one of the mottos that I use in the teaching of family psychiatry and family therapy. So here you are doing it. And as uh, as Cynthia said, um, these are family illnesses. Everyone in the family is affected, whether they are the substance abuser, the parent, the child, the grandparent, everyone is affected by it. Many of them have stress disorders, anxiety disorders. Many of them have been acting out behaviorally, but everyone is affected. And also, everyone has a story to tell. Everyone can bring their particular angle, their narrative, to the clinical setting to tell you, me, the clinician, what the problem is. So that's the real reason for me to be here with you today and to make that point. Thank you. Um, Tony, what does research tell us about the reasons why generations experience mental and substance use disorders? I think one of the things that's important to understand is that behavior is genetic and it's nurture, what happens to us. Uh, we do know with uh, traumas that are experienced by our ancestors, it, it changes our genetic process. We pass those genes on. And there have been some very good studies looking at intergenerational trauma, for instance, in the American Indian population, also in uh, the Jewish community that were, went through the Holocaust experience. And so the, we know that, that there's a change in the, the trajectory 
that people have, the offspring of people who have significant trauma. There's also very good research that shows that childhood traumas are cumulative. That one trauma can add on to the experience of another trauma, and as we keep adding those on, we increase the likelihood of a higher burden of illness. And it's not just to substance abuse, it's to a wide variety of events. So research shows us that. The term that's being used is epigenetics. Epigenetics, and that stands for? The change in your gene structure based on experiences that your ancestors have had. And based on that change in the gene structure, it is more prevalent that it would be carried on generation to generation? It appears to be that way. Very good. Um, Tian, uh, what is the impact of growing up in a family with a parent who has a mental or substance use disorder? Well, kids are at the short end of the power stick. So if you picture the family where the people in charge of it have a mental uh, issue or, or a substance abuse disorder, the, the children are small, the parents are big. The children have the keys to the house, they have the keys to the uh, car, they have the bank book. The, ch the kids are trapped in a sense, it, it being trapped, being one of the uh, big precursors of PTSD. They can't get out. So everything that happens for them is in surround sound. There's a raging parent, there's a, an ignoring parent. The child is, is suffering in that home and can't do anything uh, uh, much about it. The ameliorating factors that would build resilience lie in, in the, what you'd think of, obviously, a, a parent, a neighbor, I mean, a, 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 an extended family member, neighbor, any ex school. But while they are trapped, and while they cannot act on their own initiative to make their life better, what's coming down, what's raining down on their heads is, is frightening them, and it's frightening them more because of their lack of resources. And when a child is traumatized, when anybody's traumatized, the thinking mind shuts down, and the limbic system goes into high alert. It's part of the fight flight response. So when a kid is scared within the home, their body is recording everything that's happened. They're hearing it, they're seeing it, they're feeling it. But their thinking mind is not really making a good narrative out of it. It's not making sense out of it and putting it into the context of their overall life. So they're just stuck with a whole bunch of pain that gets triggered later when they have families of their own. And Very also they're confused, right? Because uh, yeah. what you're saying is uh, they are trapped and confused. Often they're lied to uh, yeah. to protect the family member. Yeah. Uh, and parents often think they're doing the right thing by saying nothing's going on here. Nothing. But children are smart. So they're both smart and confused at the same time. And the same people they would go to for that truth or sustenance or, or, or honesty are the people who are traumatizing them. Absolutely. Cynthia, I want to go back to you. Um, uh, you come from a family that experienced trauma, that ex that where you experienced trauma, mm -hmm. where you experienced childhood experiences, and you're also a, a person in long-term recovery. Mm -hmm. You want to talk a little bit about those experiences? Yes, I think it's really important to talk about those things because oftentimes, because of the embarrassment of coming from a family of addiction and a family of trauma, you don't talk about those things, and it's really important uh, to, to do that. So. I come from a family <clears throat> where my mother was drug addicted, my father was alcoholic, and due to my mother's drug addiction particularly, she ran away when I was eight months old. And during that next 18 years, I was raised in over 40 different homes. And in those homes, different trauma happens because you're in other people's homes, you're in family homes that are have mental illness, uh, addiction, and then you're re trying to reconnect with your family of origin because children will always want to reconnect with their family of origin and they'll want to settle in their brain because this is part of the trauma, what happened? And they'll want to settle in their brain, did I do something wrong? Did I cause this in some way? Did I make this happen in some way? So part of my recovery was actually to go get my education and become a social worker and an addiction specialist so I could work with families like mine and so I could understand. So that limbic system that you were talking about, that limbic system is in high gear and what's really important is to learn how to move your neuro pathways to your frontal cortex mm -hmm. so you can begin thinking about what occurred, 
Why did this occur? How do I change my brain so that I'm not repeating these generational patterns? So the environment that you were talking about causes some of that. The genetics cause some of that. And just that, that whole family milieu that occurred. And in my case, many family milieus. So you're trying to sort that and come to some clarity about how do I be different? How do I not carry that forward? You know, that's one of the ways this invisibly passes down is when that thinking isn't clear. So yes. we don't know why we're acting the way we act. We act mindlessly on the next generation and then we look for a reason for why we're acting that way mm -hmm. and we point the finger at the person in front of us. Okay. We are not able to go back and reflect on what may have caused the pain inside of us. All right, well when we come back we're going to continue to dialogue about these issues. We'll be right back. Addiction affects the entire family. A family in recovery is one that has recognized that the entire family needs to heal from the challenges and issues presented by mental and substance use disorders. Families who are willing to come forward at Recovery Month events about their recovery, whether it is long-standing or newly found, demonstrate the power of healing for themselves and for their communities as well. Families who are experiencing mental and or substance use disorders have a number of options for, in their search for assistance. Primary care settings and other community or faith-based organizations often can provide guidance and support for these families. Families can also turn to SAMHSA's Behavioral Health Treatment Services Locator, which can be accessed online through SAMHSA.gov or by calling 1-800-662-4357. SAMHSA also offers many publications and resources on recovery and recovery support available through our website. My experience in growing up in homes with addiction and trauma was started when I was very, very young, before cognitively I understood what was happening. In my family of origin, my mother was a, a drug addicted person, and that began before I was born. So by the time I was eight months old, uh, she left. So my first trauma was abandonment, being left, and not. Uh, the, the feelings that a baby feels when that occurs aren't ar articulated because they don't know how to articulate them. They hold them inside themselves and they manifest later in life. When I was around family members who were addicted, everybody shared their drugs. And so you thought this was loving and caring and it was, it was normal. I went to college to, to get an education and understand these diseases. And then I became an addiction counselor, social worker, and began to incorporate the recovery aspect into my life. And how does one actually move from trauma and addiction to happiness and recovery? It takes many hands to build a healthy life. Recovery from mental and substance use disorders is possible with the support of my community. Join the voices for recovery. Visible, vocal, valuable. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So Stephen, we've talked a little bit about the trauma in the family. What do we really begin to address now? What are some of the protective experiences or characteristics that boost resiliency among children whose parents experience mental or substance use disorders? Okay, so I'm very happy that we're talking about the combination of both the damaged side of the story as well as the successful or successful coping side of the story. I think we have Cynthia here as our star to show us about some of the strengths. So children are affected they can be affected in ways that produce positive coping mechanisms, resilience in themselves. Uh, they may turn to a teacher, for example, or a minister in their church, or a grandparent, and that develops a strength in them that they can do better than they've done before just 
interacting with their family members. But at the same time, they can be seriously affected negatively. So you have protective factors which help children. Which are, let's, let's delineate well, I'm, them. I've named several, uh, some of the protective factors that are not internal factors but are external factors are the church, the community religious organization, the community, the neighbors sometimes. There may be, a, I have had many examples of a child telling me that they were invited over to the neighbor's house to uh, tutor a, ch a child, younger child, and they said, well, the real reason I wanted to go was I wanted to see what families who were healthier than my family were really like. I wanted to learn from it. So a protective factor is healthy families nearby. Also teachers. Teachers often don't get the credit that they deserve because they're speaking to a child who's very vulnerable. They take them un under their wing and they really give them something that they can't get at home. So you have the school, you have the church, you have the community center, you have the grandparent, healthy grandparents. These are all protective factors for which there's a lot of research now to say that this is what adds the positive side of the story, the strength side of the story. Thank you. Uh, Tony, you, you've dealt a lot with military families. Let's talk a little bit about, in their particular case, with post-traumatic stress disorder, um, how do these children be begin to get help? What types of interventions can families look to, particularly military families, in addressing these concerns? I think it's important first to identify that there are vulnerable children different than other children who are less vulnerable. Now part of that is their genetics. So if grandpa was an alcoholic, father's an alcoholic, you know, we have the genetics there that, that puts that particular child at high risk. But there's other things that happen too. There, there are some kids who have wisdom beyond their years. They, they have the ability to see that this event causes this, this consequence. Uh, other kids have good communication skills. Other kids have good relationship development skills. And all those things are protective factors. The goal is can we cultivate those things in children? In the military setting, it, it is, it's interesting because kids who I saw typically late children and adolescents who got into trouble had a distant relationship with the deployed parent, uh, geographically obviously, but you can't really parent well through Skype. It's difficult to do that. Uh, but in situations where there's grandparents, neighbors, other loving adults providing the structure and care for that child, it decreases their overall risk. So we have the genetic side, we have the nurture side, which is uh, what we end up helping happen. So if we, can, if we can facilitate that process to help kids get the things that they need, and the key is everybody doesn't need the same thing. So the person who's working with them has to have the intimacy to know what does that child need. And Tian, how can um, intervention help interrupt intergenerational? I mean, we've talked about having the grandparent, the teacher, everyone. But as we look at these resources and support mm -hmm. systems, potential support mm -hmm. systems within these mm -hmm. settings, what does that person need to think about if a child comes to them with a problem? And how can, how can those individuals best handle those situations? Well, part of resiliency is the ability of a child to mobilize their own support network. Now that doesn't mean just going to a therapist. It might mean saying, there's no money, I need to get a job. I need to get a job and, what, and I need to get a bank account. I need to start planning for my future. I need, to, I need to understand that I do have a future. It's not necessarily always getting help, though getting help uh, is, is critical. It's whatever can help that child feel independent, feel they can take care of themselves, and feel that they've still got a future. So th it, when we think resiliency, it's not only what's going on in the child, it's what's going on in the child's network. And one bonded relationship is across all the resiliency work, uh, research. Ch resilient kids have one person who cares about them, one person who reaches in and drags them out and, and knows they're alive. So the intervention, anything you can make conscious and bring out of the darkness will, will give you choice. 
Very a good. nice thing to highlight in terms of that one important person is that it's not just an accident that somebody is there for the child. Often the child is doing what we called in our work recruiting. Mm -hmm. They actually are making themselves attractive mm -hmm. yeah. to an adult. They're looking them straight in the eye. You know, they're as adults love to have children ask them questions. They learn to ask a child a to ask an adult a question. Mm -hmm. The uh, adult falls in love with that child. That's a real strength that a child has. That's a real resilience. And it carries through yeah. to jobs. And, too. and then they become social workers. They <laughs> become psychiatrists. <laughs> I, think, I think it's important to, to realize, though, that that child who's involved in that recruiting process is really at the mercy of the adult. Mm -hmm. And so the, oh, yeah. the, the child or adolescent yearning for a coach or a father figure or a mother figure puts themselves at risk. Oh, yes. Thank goodness mm -hmm. most adults mm -hmm. are appropriate. But we need to be vigilant that there are some adults who are predators and well, put them at risk. Mm -hmm. yes. That's a good point. And I think the other thing is that we have to always keep in mind first when we have children from these systems is their safety. Right. Safety is first. They, and then the basic needs. Are they getting food? Do they have a place to live? Do they have clothing? Do they have what they need to go to school? Oftentimes we, we get involved in wondering about their trauma when their basic needs aren't met. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to do both because mm -hmm. without the basic needs met, they'll be re-traumatized again. It's very embarrassing to have to ask for clothing. Or um, if you're in a situation like that, sometimes people aren't washing your clothes and you don't have ability to do that because there's no soap or there's no washing machine. So how do you help these children looking at their their basic needs and then looking at their emotional, psychological needs as well. And also looking for a, a, a place where that particular person who is exposed to this child also recognizes the, his or her limitations in being able to help and looks for outside help, Cynthia? Exactly. So in my own experience, it was really, uh, it, it, it didn't happen where I had someone come in right away to help. The, the movement kept happening from home to home. So there wasn't an intervention mm -hmm. for a long time because in the, it, many people thought, well, let's get her back to her mom or let's get her back to her dad, which wasn't a healthy environment. So it wasn't safe. So we weren't thinking you know, about safety. We were thinking about, well, let's just bond the family. What we know today is that that isn't positive bonding and that it will not help that child. So now we look at where's the best place for this child? Who do I need to refer this child to? Who can help this child get on a positive track that will help their lives change? And that's really what we're looking to do. If we can change, uh, intervene in their, their lives early, there's less trauma. There's less recovery process mm -hmm. that they need to learn because then in adulthood, we're learning how to recover. And sometimes we really screw up relationships because of what mm -hmm. happened in our early mm -hmm. childhood, and then that uh, that re-traumatizes us. So it's in, it's really helpful when we get those interventions. The earlier, the better. One but, of my interventions was uh, from a church choir mm -hmm. master who took me aside and said, "I think you can sing soprano or alto," and I, it was a safe haven, and I can sing the liturgy in Greek, and it was a place to go where that was driven, fed, taken care of, valued. So it's, it can come from different places. Anybody can mobilize what they've got. I think many young people see sports as something they can excel in, academics mm -hmm. as something they can, they can excel in, and that replaces some of the needs that they have in the family setting that, do, that are not being satisfied. So there's all kinds of things, and that's why it's important not to say this is the one way to do it. Mm -hmm. I think that the, especially the teenager has to play some role in what they really mm -hmm. feel empowered with. Mm -hmm. what they really feel connects to them. It's also important to alert that coach and that teacher what role they are playing mm -hmm. because often they haven't been reinforced to how important their role is. Very few successful uh, students write back and say, you know, you were the one who made the difference in my life. I'll never forget when you put your hand on my shoulder and said, you're going to become a great person someday, an artist or a writer or an athlete or Very parent. good. And when we come back, I want to continue to talk about what resources are available to families who are experiencing generational trauma. We'll be right back.
HealthQuest was founded in 2008. We have counseling services under one roof along with the medical and the pharmacy side. Currently we have four locations and we are actually working on our fifth. We have about 50 to 60 employees and probably about 15 to, to 20 pharmacists. And we're, we're still expanding and looking for places that, that need us. The primary goal here at HealthQuest is is to help patients detox off of opiates, whether that is heroin or some type of pain medication that they've received from prescribed from a doctor or, or illicitly on the streets. A lot of those people started using opiates that they either found in the parents' medicine cabinet, under the cabinet. They got their first experience doing that. As a mother, I am trying to break the patterns of my childhood that my mother had with me when I was growing up. The opiates is what gets them in the door because that's what we treat, but there, there are other issues along with, with the opiates normally, and we'll refer them out for help. The methadone helps me stay clean on a daily basis, and it, it, it actually has even taken uh, the use of me wanting to drink away, and I have not had anything to drink in over four years. The medication is a very, very small part of what we do here. Um, counseling and education is, is the key to success. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that we give the life skills so that a patient can go out in society and, and live a normal life. And you can't do that in 28 days. It takes time. So 12 to 18 months sometimes, sometimes longer. Because um, we, we have to teach people how to live all over. You know, Aggressive counseling is the only thing that, that really assists with that. Our secondary mission here at HealthQuest is to help decrease any risky behaviors a patients may be exhibiting in their in their day to day life when they come into treatment. Um, types of behaviors: IV drug use, um, unprotected, unsafe sex, risk of overdose, and any illegal activity that may be going on in, in their in their life at the time. This is not a cookie cutter type of treatment here. And at HealthQuest, we want to assist um, any patient that comes in with the needs they may have, whether those are employment needs, educational needs, um, housing needs. You know, we, we have patients that have children that they don't have clothes for them, you know. Um, we, do, we do clothing drives, things like that to assist the patients. And it's the little things like that that help someone bring some normalcy to their life. And normalcy is needed before anyone can progress to actually really succeed in recovery. Staying on course without support is tough. With help from family and community, you get valuable support for recovery from a mental or substance use disorder. Join the Voices for Recovery. Visible. Vocal. Valuable. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Mental health and substance use disorders are definitely transferred through generations. Uh, mental health and uh, substance use disorders are a, a family disease, and it affects all members of the family, especially children. Uh, children in, in those kinds of families tend to take on responsibilities that are inappropriate, um, are often uh, affected by other kinds of mood disorders, uh, and carry that with them their whole life um, if they're not addressed. Um, part of it is uh, parenting the parent, uh, accepting roles that are inappropriate, and having a sense of over-responsibility. So it definitely affects children. There are definite links between um, uh, substance use disorders and, uh, and, and genetics so that um, you can inherit that from generation to generation. You can also sort of pick it up environmentally. So I think it's a combination of both uh, genetics and environment that, that uh, affect uh, individuals and children as they grow up uh, having uh, addiction and other kinds of disorders. Cynthia, there's a new term being uh, uh, shared about, uh, it's called multi-generational households. Uh, can you explain a little bit about those and, and, and what are some of the issues that that is creating? Because of the economy today and also because of family patterns, we're seeing people uh, live more together or more connected. We see the sandwich, what we call the sandwich generation. We see people in their 40s, 50s, 60s caring for younger children or teenage children, young adults, and they're also caring for their parents 
or o older persons. And so we see this multi-generational uh, impact or this multi-generational family living or communicating, being responsible for each other happening more today. More younger people are staying in the home longer. So they're living at home till they're in their 20s, um, partially because they can't afford to live somewhere else. And so this impact, this causes more stress in the family because there's more needs. There's the needs on this end of the, the spectrum where there's older person's issues and young person's issues. And then the person in the middle is going, oh my gosh, how, how do I deal with all this? Very good. And are there resources? We really haven't started talking about resources for families. Um, uh, what is available to families if indeed they're in a multi-generational setting and on top of that they're experiencing issues of substance and, and, and mental uh, disorders? So I think kind of compart compartmentalizing that a little bit is helpful. So looking at what are the needs of the senior persons. Is there a senior center that's doing some services? Is there outreach, home outreach through uh, Department of Social and Health Services? What's available through the, the senior health services that is countywide? So most counties have human services and they have different compartments for that. So they have senior specific, they have young adult specific, they'll have mental health services or co-occurring where a person has mental health and addiction diseases, and there's addiction services. So it's important to find out in your community where's your local help and what, uh, what services do they actually provide. And uh, Tony, what it really, um uh, Cynthia talked a little bit about the pressures among the generations, but for the, the middle generation that is trying to take care of both ends, or the sandwich generation, let's call them, um, what are some of the resources that might be available uh, that can help that person um, cope, quite frankly, with some of those issues? And, and I mean those uh, uh, formal resources and how should they uh, institute self-care? Well, I think it's important for the, for the family members to communicate first. They need to realize that if a teenager's in trouble or if grandpa's in trouble, that they can get services in the community. The problem is that from state to state and even from agency to agency, for instance, military versus VA versus Indian health, things like that, there's wide variation on a geographic basis. It's, it's also dependent on the individual providers. Some people are highly dedicated to the mission. Some people are not. So it's, it, it behooves the sand, sandwich generation people to be aware of what's available in the community. The only way you can find out is to look. Uh, there's, there's good services in people who are in the federal system. So military has these types of services. There's a stigma, though, that happens when people say, well, I think my husband has an alcohol problem or my teenager has been caught using marijuana at school. And it creates a sense of shame which is part of the disease. People are afraid to get the help. And typically it's like, it's not that big of a deal, they'll all grow it, it creates problems because if you wait too late, the situation typically gets much, much worse. So it's important for people to have some connectedness, connectedness in the family, but also connectedness in the community. Very good. Tian, uh, Cynthia mentioned uh, that sometimes uh, grandparents are in the home, sometimes the grandparents are really called upon to, to really uh, uh, take a, a more prominent role mm -hmm. just on their own and mm -hmm. by themselves. Does mm -hmm. that create for them a particular situation where they themselves might become at risk of, of uh, uh, falling into uh, dysfunction themselves with, with their own situation? Well, I think the grandparents lack energy. They, we at our age don't have the energy to follow toddlers around the way we did. And we um, we, but we love them. I mean, we, we love them in a way that I don't know that it's, I, I think it surprises us. So we are fiercely protective of these toddlers and we may go beyond our own, our own capacity in taking care of them. I think it depends on the state of the sandwich generation. If the sandwich generation means that person's going out to work and the grandparents are relatively functional, then what you've got is a good support system, possibly. It, it's not all a, a dark story. But, it, but I think the, uh, the older people need to take extra good care of themselves and, and recognize their own limitations if they're in charge. 
Mm. Cynthia, you know, um, uh, we just finished doing uh, over 50 uh, and, and, and dealing with the older generation and, and their consumption of alcohol. There's, there's a trend, a tremendous trend now where older Americans are mm -hmm. consuming alcohol at a higher level. Mm -hmm. They're getting medicated for heart medication. They're getting medicated for arthritis. They're getting medicated for a host of other ailments that are part and parcel of growing older. Mm -hmm. um, a, a position on top of that, having to take care of grandkids or, or dealing with, with issues related to family trauma, How, what happens? Well, what happens is that this late onset drinking, so they may never have drank to abuse before in their lives, very productive, working, taking care of their family. Now they're older, they're home, uh, not working as much, kind of trying to understand their own role in society now. And so they start drinking more socially sometimes with the other seniors, going to places of gambling, to be around other people, and you see this pattern that's happening with our some of our older adults where they're drinking and they're looking for a way to bond again and feel capable and lovable. And that's basically what we all want to feel, whatever generation we are, is we want to feel capable and lovable, and so we look for it. And alcohol has a way of reducing the pain. And so uh, I may be on a medication and I'm drinking on top of it and I don't understand the synergistic effect of the alcohol with the medication. And so I'm continuing this path and it's causing other medical problems. It may cause problems in the home. I may not be as responsible as I was. I may not be looking after those children the way that I was looking after them before I started this path. So it's, it, it can be very dynamic in a family situation when people aren't talking about what they're seeing as well so that they can intervene Very early. Good. Stephen, talk to us about some of the warning signs for these folks that are placed in these scenarios. You're talking about the grandparents now? Yes. Warning yes. signs to grandparents? To grandparents. That and, and, what, and how can they, they, they... What can they do? What can they do in terms of seeking help? Okay, uh, yes. I actually, while you were asking the question about resources, I thought about the three most recent resources I recommended older family members to. One of them is NAMI, right? National Association for Mentally Ill, right? And uh, they have branches. They, they ha uh, I'm sure your people know about them. The second is actually Al-Anon where I've referred people who never would have thought that they should go to Al-Anon meetings to try it out because they will A, learn things about their own family and B, they'll get connected up with a, lo a lot of information from other people who are there in the Al-Anon meetings. So that's been very helpful. Also, most, I have to say, social workers, more than psychiatrists, are going to be familiar with state agencies, the kind of organizations that Tony was talking about before, state agencies that might be receiving grant money from SAMHSA from other places are prepared to offer services to an older, an older parent. They have to say the word family though. They have to say, my family needs help. Where can I go? That is what I keep nudging them to do. Very good. I'd like to add on sure. what Cynthia was talking about in regard to the misuse of alcohol. Uh, that same scenario happens with pain medication and tranquilizers. And we have an epidemic of opioids going on right now. And opioids, for some people, are not used to treat pain. It's to treat anxiety. It's to treat heart pain, emotional pain. It's to treat a sense of, I need to have something that makes me feel different. And those are all slippery slopes from the standpoint of use to misuse to abuse and sometimes to dependence. And unfortunately, alcohol and opioids create a physical dependence very quickly. A person can be put on pain medication for a minor fracture, and two months later, they can't stop. And we are in a society right now where physicians, some physicians and some mid-level providers, prescribe outrageous amounts of these medications. And we have, last year, we lost 19,000 people from accidental overdoses. I mean, th these are numbers that are astronomical and every community has them. And when people die in a family that has a history of addiction, it's always quiet. We don't bring it up. It just happened. 
and it and it, it doesn't it allows that cycle of dependence to continue rather than al uh, allowing people to say enough uh, this has to stop and it's very hard for families to talk about that and yes. the, the over treatment of the older people mm -hmm. very good um, when we come back uh, we will continue with our conversation and with identification of more resources. We'll be right back. Addiction is the number one cause of dysfunction and conflict in families today. Alcohol addiction is the most pervasive, but other drug abuse is rampant as well, from prescription pills to marijuana, cocaine, speed, heroin, Gambling, sexually compulsive behaviors, and eating disorders impact many families. More common than not now, many families are affected by a combination of addictive disorders. While the substance or the behavior varies, the family systems operate with many of the same dysfunctional family rules, rules that fuel an ongoing legacy of addiction. Don't talk, don't trust, and don't feel. For those with mental or substance use disorders, what does recovery look like? It's a transformation. It's a supporting hand. It's new beginnings. When does recovery start? It starts when you ask for help and support. Join the Voices for Recovery. Speak up. Reach out. For information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I grew up in a family that had um, a lot of addictions, uh, physical addictions with abuse, um, alcohol abuse, and drug, drug abuse. I didn't know any other way of living because that's all I'd ever known. As a younger child, as a middle class family, there didn't appear to be any problems until early teens. Um, there was a good bit of conflict between my parents due to my dad's drinking. Um, it, escalated to uh, their divorce and um, I was 14 at the time and then uh, course ended his drinking ended in a early death at 49. It is a family as a whole because addiction affects everyone in the family. A lot of times it starts with them when they're when they're when they're a child in their childhood. I'm glad that my wife's in treatment with me. Because I don't want my kids to ever live like I do. I want to break the chain. We found HealthQuest after trying a number of other methadone programs, and we've been here over two years. And like I say, this is by far the best program with regard to methadone that we've experienced, and we, this was the third one we've tried. When the family comes together and the family works with the same goal, it's much easier for recovery to take place. The kids are very thankful of this program for the, the positive influence it's had on our behavior. HealthQuest is providing an avenue to, to have goals and to pursue and achieve goals. I now have a future where before I lived day to day, for a long time my wife and I did. The reason I got into this was so I could help people. Yeah. I want people to, to have hope. I'm very proud and very pleased to, to be in the situation I'm in now, as opposed to you know the way my father was. It's very important to me to make a difference, to be out there and to provide a service that brings people in um, when they're at their lowest in their life, that they're struggling, they're, they, they need help, they need direction, and we're here to help them and pick them up and, and point them in the right direction and give them some resources that they need to, to become successful and, and to really work through their addiction. I'm definitely shifting the family pattern of abuse um, from the experiences I know that my wife and I both had with our parents to what our children and now grandchildren will have with us. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved, or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. So, Cynthia, uh, we we really have talked about every 
possible scenario of issues, well, not every, but mm -hmm. almost every, many, mm -hmm. many scenario issues related to, to families that are experiencing dysfunction, trauma, et cetera. Uh, due to mental and substance use disorders. But is there hope for these families? What, what can we say to our audience in order for them to really place this in the context of individuals needing to seek, seek help? There is hope. Families change, the brain changes. Being with a professional who can help you walk through that and learn the different, different mechanisms for that is essential. So. Obviously, there's hope. There's millions of people in recovery. 23 million people are in recovery from addictive and mental health disorders across this country. They found support through 12-step programs, other programs. Many have found support through associations like ours where people are trained as addiction and family professionals, and they can get the help and the support that they need. Those people are in their local communities. Going to a trained, uh, uh, physician for medical issues, going to a trained mental health and substance use disorder counselor is very important because these are the people who know the signs and the symptoms and they know how to help walk you through your recovery. And that's essential. Absolutely. Well, from my perspective, the strength has to begin within the family. Okay? I'm sure you're not surprised to hear me say that. I've been saying that now. And when the family gets together, they become empowered when they are honest with each other. They come up with ideas. They offer opportunities for each of them to help each other. So I would say the beginning of resources is inside the family. And um, when that happens, you usually find that they then are able to communicate with a provider, for example, and say, our family needs help. That gets to the point that Tony was making about stigma. Once the family confronts the reality of their problem, they're already 25% of the way there because they are ready to take on the system and they're ready to turn to the provider, the state agency, you know, maybe a hospital, you know, uh, some helper. Uh, and I think from there, good things can happen. Who within the family makes that call? I am. I am a child. I don't. I don't know what Makes to do. I'm call. too young. Um, uh, uh, mom, dad. Mom may have a mental disorder. Dad may have maybe an alcoholic. Um, who within that family uh, begins that process? Because I agree with you. I think it does begin. You know, within inside the, fa the family. inside the family. But how do we? make that happen within the family. How do we if I'm begin listening, that process? How do saying? we begin that? Actually, we're talking about someone who has some good coping skills will do it, right? They're going to say, Grandma, we got a problem here. Mom and Dad had a fight again, and Daddy was drunk. We need help, Grandma. Can you figure something out? So there's a child doing it. There might be a grandma who does it who calls her daughter and say, I'm really worried. I don't think you told me what happened last week. How come? I want to know the truth. There might be a child, actually, who's doing it with an uncle. So I, I would say we can't identify the person, but they better open their mouth and speak some honest truth to another family member. So let me add a debate to this, because not every family has that ability. In fact, there are some children that need to leave their family and go to a different place in order to get the help. Some families are so dysfunctional, there is no path. There is no one going to take responsibility. So it's great when there is. I will say that. It's great. And once that person does get support and help, then they may at some point when they're ready and when they're safe enough to go back and, and intervene I'm in their family. You remind me of that, Be that it, you're going outside the family to start the process. Sometimes perhaps. you have to. So my belief coming from this and then also being a social worker is that there are several different, many pathways to start this process of getting the help that you need so that you can. What's important is that self-empowerment that you talked mm -hmm. about earlier. How do we help people become self-empowered to say, 
I'm going to reach for that. I'm going to go for that. No matter what this background is with my family, I'm going to go for this because I want something different. But bet you teaches that in her psychodrama I sessions, right? You're exactly right. I wanted to underline absolutely everything you said. And if you, if you can get that child to open their mouth, but we, there is no one, one way fits all in this. This is a cross the board kind of mess. And there are across the board solutions. So one, one way I do it is experientially, I try to give people the ability through role play to talk about what can't be talked about. Oftentimes casting a surrogate. You can talk to an empty chair representing your mother. Uh, you, where, rather than talking to your mother, you can double behind yourself and become conscious of what's going on in your inner world that is not being spoken from your role comfortably. And through these small interventions, remarkable things can happen. Once people get conscious of what's going on and they feel a little ability to open their mouths, miracles can happen. I think it's important for family culture to value every member and realize that people change over the course of time. People have good days, people have bad right. days. And if it's possible for, whether it's the child, the adult, or the aging adult, uh, all of them have valuable input and val valuable comment. Uh, and no family's perfect. There's gonna be, you know, you made me upset when you said that. Th right. th that's important to have that dialogue as part of normal family function. Uh, people who are severely impaired with substances doesn't mean they do everything badly. Mm -hmm. And so, the, so there are things that they do that have value to the family. Mm -hmm. and, and even though some kids do need to be removed because of safety issues, those children still have an attachment mm -hmm. to that family of origin. And it's something mm -hmm. that they yearn for. They, they may not get it. But uh, in Indian health, I mean, we have a, a family preservation. And the, the, there's a process that you can't just take a native child out and put them in a non-native family. Mm -hmm. And it's because we've seen what happened. Mm -hmm. We've seen what happened to those children. They lose their culture. But that mm -hmm. intergenerational trauma persists. Right. And there's high rates of problems mm -hmm. when those kids are taken away from that cultural support. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now we get to the point in the show where I'm going to give you a few moments to give you an opportunity uh, for final thoughts. So we'll start with uh, Stephen. Well, I'm banging the same drum um, that there are both strengths as well as damaged factors inside of children with substance abuse, for parents with substance abuse problems and mental health problems. They have coping skills, but they also may have some weaknesses. Okay. We have to, as professionals, our job is to be able to distinguish those and to support them. So I'm on the side of what Tony just said, which is to watch for those strengths, to recognize the weaknesses, to be able to distinguish the difference and to go for the strengths to help the whole family. Cynthia. I would say recovery is a process. We're not going to, people don't recover overnight. It's a process. It's like peeling an onion, layers and layers, and the layers of family, the layers of trauma, the layers of positive possibilities, the layers of future are all in that onion. And it's just important to stay in it, stay in that recovery process and believe in the hope. And it does, it does happen. Yes, look at you. Look. You are a perfect example. Not perfect. <laughs> so the adult children of alcoholic syndrome is a post-traumatic stress disorder in which childhood pain is surfacing in adult relationships. It doesn't get better, it gets worse. So treat it, treat it, treat it. Don't expect it to get better on its own. Head straight to an Al-Anon meeting. Head straight to an AA meeting if you think you've got, or, or NA or whatever, and ask a bunch of questions. Get started, get out the door, don't stop until you get going. Thank you. Tony. I remember 40 years ago in med school, one of my professors said, um, you have to remember two things. Number one, you can't find a fever unless you take a temperature. So that means that we need to look for things. We need to actually identify that there are situations that need to be addressed. And the second thing was prophetic. Don't go down alone. Take all your friends with you. So get the help you need, which means sometimes you do need to have professional help. And many families see that as a negative, but it's, it's important to rescue the family. Look at your liabilities, look at your assets, and make that decision to help your family. 
Excellent. And we want to thank you for being here. It was a wonderful experience. And remind our audience that September is National Recovery Month. We want you to go to our website, recoverymonth.gov, and learn about all the activities that you can put together for 2016 to celebrate Recovery 